the world is going to have a new monetary system in this decade that we're in. We're going to experience this huge deflationary crash around the world and people will just lose confidence in currency. We are entering a period of financial crisis that is the greatest the world has ever known. The wealth transfer that will take place during this decade is the greatest wealth transfer in history. Wealth is never destroyed, it is merely transferred, and that means that on the opposite side of every crisis there is an opportunity. The great news is that all you have to do to turn this crisis into your great opportunity is to educate yourself. I believe that the best investment that you can make in your lifetime is your own education. Education on the history of money, education on finance, education on how the global economy works, education on how all of these guys, the central bankers, the stock market, how they can cheat you, how they can scam you. If you learn what is going on and how the financial world works, you can put yourself on the correct side of this wealth transfer. Winston Churchill once said that the further you look into the past, the further that you can see into the future. This program is all about creating your own crystal ball, being able to gaze into the future, being able to change this crisis, the greatest crisis in the history of mankind, into your great opportunity. They say that money doesn't grow on trees, but the truth is that the modern banking system creates currency far faster than trees can grow. Most people don't have a clue how currency is created. Economists and bankers make it sound so complex that people think they can't understand it. But I'm going to strip our monetary system down to its essence so that you can see the scam behind the curtain and just how it affects you. Every modern society creates currency in pretty much the same way. But since the U.S. dollar is the majority of the world's currency, I'm going to use the United States as our example. It all starts when some politician says, vote for me and I'll make sure the government provides you more free stuff than my opponent will. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. So to provide that supposedly free stuff, the politicians vote for the country to spend more than its income. This is called deficit spending. To pay for that deficit spending, the Treasury borrows currency by issuing a bond. So what's a bond? If you think about it, a bond is really nothing but a glorified IOU. It's a pretty piece of paper with numbers printed on it that says, loan me a trillion dollars today and I promise over a 10 year period I'm going to pay you back that trillion dollars plus interest. But what you need to understand is that treasury bonds are our national debt. These glorified IOUs are to be paid back by you and I and our descendants through future taxation. Therefore, when the government issues a bond, it steals prosperity out of the future so that it can spend it today. The Treasury then holds a bond auction, and the world's largest banks show up and compete to buy part of our national debt and make a profit on it by earning interest. You'll notice that as we move through this process, the big banks are there, taking a cut every step of the way. This isn't by chance, as you'll see shortly. Then, through a shell game called open market operations, the banks get to sell some of those bonds to the Federal Reserve at a profit. To pay for the bonds, the Federal Reserve opens up its big old checkbook and writes bad, bogus, counterfeit checks that should bounce because they're drawn on an account that always has a zero balance, there isn't one penny in there. To quote from the Boston Federal Reserve, when you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover that check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. The Fed then hands those checks to the banks and at this point currency springs into existence. The banks then take that currency and buy more bonds at the next treasury auction. But what is a check? A check is also an IOU. When you write a check, you're making a note that says, here's my IOU for cash. All you have to do is go to the bank and pick it up. Now it's very, very important that you understand this process because we're going to come back later and show you the devastating effect this has on you. The Treasury issues IOUs, bonds. The banks then buy those IOUs with currency. The Federal Reserve then writes IOUs, checks, 
and hands them to the banks in exchange for the Treasury's IOUs, the bonds. And currency is created. So what's really happening is the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are just swapping IOUs, using the banks as middlemen, and abracadabra, presto, currency magically springs into existence. This process repeats and repeats over and over again, enriching the banks and indebting the public by raising the national debt. The end result is that there's a buildup of bonds at the Federal Reserve and currency at the Treasury. This process is also where all paper currency comes from. The Federal Reserve and the government mistakenly call it base money because they didn't watch episode one of this series and they don't know the difference between money and currency. But I will correctly refer to it as base currency because it is not money. It is currency and as we've learned, there is a big difference. Money has to be a store of value and maintain its purchasing power over long periods of time. We learned in episode one that earlier in our history, our paper currency was just a claim check. It was a representation for real money of intrinsic value, the gold and silver that was held on deposit at the treasury. You could walk into any bank and slap your currency, like say a $20 bill on the counter and redeem it for real money, a $20 gold piece. But now this base currency that's piling up back here is really nothing but a receipt or a claim check on an IOU, that bond. So it's really nothing but a supply of numbers. The Treasury then deposits the newly created currency into the various branches of the government, and the politicians say, hey, thanks for that. And the government does some deficit spending on public works, social programs, and war. The government employees, contractors, and soldiers then deposit their pay in the banks. Now this may come as a shock to you, but when you deposit your currency with the bank, you're not actually depositing it into an account to be safely held in trust for you. Instead, you're actually loaning the bank your currency, and within certain legal limits, they can do with it pretty much anything they please. This includes gambling in the stock market and loaning it out, at a profit, of course. Now this is where the machine of currency creation really gets cranking, because this is where something called fractional reserve lending comes into play. Fractional reserve lending is exactly what it says. The banks are allowed to reserve only a fraction of your deposit and loan the rest out. Although reserve ratios may vary, I'm going to use a 10% reserve ratio as our example. If you deposit $100 in your account, the bank can legally take $90 of it and loan it out without telling you. The bank must hold $10 of your deposit in reserve just in case you want some of it. These reserves are called vault cash. But why does your bank account still say you have $100 if the bank has stolen $90 of it? Because the bank left IOUs it created, called bank credit, in its place. Now I know this sounds crazy, but here it is in black and white from the Fed. Commercial banks create checkbook money when they grant a loan simply by adding new deposit dollars in accounts on their books in exchange for a borrower's IOU. These are nothing but numbers that the banks type into their computers. And even though these bank credit IOU numbers are very different from base currency numbers, because they only exist in computers, they are still currency. So now there is $190 in existence. Now the reason people take out loans from the banks is to buy something. They're going to buy a house or a car or something like that. So the borrower takes the $90 that the bank loaned to him from your account and he pays the seller of the item. But then the seller deposits that currency into his account and his bank loans out 90% of that and leaves bank credit numbers in its place. So now there's $271 in existence. This process repeats and repeats until under a 10% reserve ratio, an initial deposit of just $100 can create up to $1,000 of bank credit, all backed by $100 of vault cash, just 10%. But as I said, reserve ratios vary wildly. On some deposits, it's 10%, on others, it's 3%, and on some forms of deposits, reserve requirements are zero. The result is that the expansion of the currency supply by the banks is far greater than even this example would lead you to believe. So once again, when currency is deposited in the banks, the banks get to lend it out, and then it gets redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent, redeposited and relent over and over again, creating bank credit all the way. This is where the vast majority of our currency supply comes from. 
In fact, 92 to 96 percent of all currency in existence is created, not by the government, but here in the banking system. Now, massive amounts of currency spewing into society may at first sound like a fun idea. That is, until you remember one of the most important hidden secrets of money from episode one, that the prices of everyday goods and services act as a sponge on an expanding currency supply. The more currency we have, the more prices rise. This is where inflation comes from. The true definition of inflation is an expansion of the currency supply. Rising prices are merely the symptom. So our entire currency supply is nothing but a couple of bucks whipped up in this hocus pocus scam where the Treasury and the Federal Reserve swap glorified IOUs and a bunch of numbers that the banks just type into their computers. That's it. That's our entire currency supply. It's nothing but a supply of numbers. Some of them printed, most of them typed, and there is nothing else. But if you thought that was crazy, get ready to enter the twilight zone of modern economics. We work for some of that currency supply. True wealth is your time, but we trade away moments of our lives, hour by hour, day by day, and year by year, for numbers that somebody printed on pieces of paper or just typed into a computer. Now those numbers represent our blood, sweat, tears, labor, ideas, and talent. We are what gives the currency its value. But here comes the really cruel joke. We work hard, so that we can save some of that currency, so that we can pay the tax collector in the United States, it's known as the IRS. They then turn it over to the Treasury so that the Treasury can pay the principal plus interest on that bond that the Federal Reserve bought with a check drawn on an account that has nothing in it. This next five years is gonna see the world change more than you can possibly imagine. But today, the world is anything but that, right? Today, the world is global and exponential. Something happens in China or India, you know about it seconds later. Computers know about it microseconds later. Things aren't changing century to century or decade to decade. They are changing year to year. And if I were to graph that, it looks like this. That red line is all of us. It's our teachers, our students, our friends, our board members, our politicians. We haven't had a hardware or software upgrade in 50 million years. It's been a while, right? That yellow line is the technology that we're creating. Artificial intelligence, robotics, synthetic biology, computers, networks, sensors, 3D printers, all of these technologies are doubling in power year to year to year. And the difference between these two lines, between us sort of linear thinking humans not really changing in our biology very much and this growing technology is either disruptive stress or disruptive opportunity. So, I talk about exponential. What is exponential? And we're all educators here in one form or another, and we know an exponential is a simple doubling. But remember I said that as humans, our brains are wired to think linearly, right? I teach my four and a half year old kids, you know, count to 30, take 30 steps, one, two, three, four, five. In 30 steps, I'm in the back of the room, 30 meters away. But if I said to you, I want you to take not 30 linear steps, but 30 exponential steps, you know, where an exponential is simple doubling, one, two, four, eight, 16, 32, unless you have it memorized, in 30 exponential steps, and 30 doublings, you're not in the back of the room, you're a billion meters away. Put differently, you've gone around the planet 26 times. And so that difference between linear thinking which is the hardware, the wiring, the way we're evolutionary designed to think, and exponential growth, which is the technology that we're creating, that we're using, that our kids are playing with, is really different. And we're now entering the phase of exponential growth, and it's important for all of us to understand the implications of that. Digital currency goes up in value when there's a strong digital economy. So the question is, what is our economy going to be globally over the next few months and years? So the goal here is to really talk about disruption. Our business world is changing faster than most of you realize. There used to be a time where people worked for 40 years to get that gold watch. Today's best-selling watch 
doesn't even work for 24 hours. So what is different? What are we doing? Why do we live in a time where 100-year-old companies disappear, and yet every month there's a new self-made billionaire in their 20s or 30s? Those self-made billionaires have the same 24 hours in a day that you and I do. But here's what's also happening. Half of all the office jobs globally will disappear over the next 10 years. 3D printing will wipe out 300 million manufacturing jobs. And self-driving cars and trucks will get rid of millions and millions of more. So what's different about today's businesses? The world's biggest hotel chain owns no hotels. The world's biggest taxi company owns no cars. And the world's biggest media company creates no media. And the lastly, the world's biggest retailer, Alibaba, has no inventory. What they're all doing is leveraging big data. And big data is what's going to drive your business and the future. So in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about how you can change your life and five steps to becoming a disruptor. Think about it. In the last 90 days, Pokemon Go did $470 million. Any of you could have launched that. It could take a cryptocurrency. This is why this is so important to the future of OneCoin and what you're about. In two seconds about me, I've spent the past three decades disrupting different industries, and I've had the pleasure to work with and be partnered with some of the most influential and forward-seeking people on the planet. And what I've learned from that is that things are changing so fast that unless you pay attention, it could cost you your career. So what is changing? So there are three things to focus on. Digital currency, 3D printing, and for fun, we're going to talk about the electric drill. So the first step to changing the world is to get outside of your comfort zone. Business as usual is dead. Half of all the jobs that presently exist in the U.S. will disappear. It's just like when we went from farming to industry. Today, it takes 1.6% of the U.S. population to feed the rest and export. The same automation is going to happen to big businesses and small. So where are the opportunities? Many people thought it was with big companies, but as you can see, of the Fortune 500 companies, only 57 are left. So what companies are going to disappear? And the ones that stay will not be making the same products that they did just five years ago. Think about it. Apple, the largest company in the world, was a failed computer company. They went into phones. They're going into cars. What are they seeing that's different? Who's next? Where are the opportunities to flourish where cryptocurrency will grow the most and be the most valuable? So the first thing to look at is the world around us is dematerializing. Physical items are disappearing. The supply chain that makes physical items is being replaced. Think about your desk. You used to have all these items that were manufactured in a factory, shipped on a boat into a truck, stocked at retail, and slowly and now faster, every single item has been replaced by an app. We are living in a post-physical world. The majority of all purchases are done for digital goods. The majority of all income goes to digital goods. That's the opportunity for a digital currency. So I'm here to talk to you about blockchain technology. Uh, it's something most people don't understand. 
And so I like to uh, take you back in time uh, just to set the context, uh, because we all understand the internet today, um, but it wasn't that long ago that very few people understood what that is, and uh, here is how I like to start this conversation. I wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At. See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Kay said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around I'd never heard it about, said. About, I'd about, always seen the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <laughs> yeah, I heard it around or about in the lunchroom. <laughs> See, there it is. Violence at NBC, GE, com. I mean... Well, what Allison that? should know. What, what is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network. Mm -hmm. The one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big? What, how does one... No, what, do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in 10 seconds or less. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is, what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up, made up of, uh, started from... Oh, I thought uh, you were going to tell us what this was. It's so like a, look a in computer the dictionary. billboard. It's, it's not a... It's, it, it's, it's a... So I like to start here because we all understand the internet and we use it. It's pervasive in all of our lives every day today. Um, and I think that blockchain technology is essentially where um, the internet was in, call it, 1994. Um, this is also a, an article from Newsweek in 1995 talking about how the internet's going to fail and essentially it's only used by, you know, criminals and that it's a passing fad and it's going to go away. And I think that this is a useful set of context because, you know, what have you heard about Bitcoin? You've probably heard it's insecure. You've heard of this company, Mt. Gox, that failed and hundreds of millions of dollars disappeared. Well, the underlying protocol has never been hacked. It is the most secure system the world has ever seen. If you take all of Google's global infrastructure, you know, times 100, uh, that's the kind of uh, uh, security or hashing. It's over an exoflop, uh, the Bitcoin network. So it's the most secure system the world has ever seen. Um, the first, those companies that failed were essentially banks that left their vaults open. Um, you've also probably heard that it's used by criminals. You may have heard of this thing called the Silk Road. Um, you know, much like the internet was only used for bad things. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, that's not really the case. Yes, there are some bad things done with this. Any, any new technology is going to have uh, a yin and a yang. Uh, you're going to see good uses and bad uses. And as the technology develops, the call it early fringe users become a minority and the call it mainstream adopters end up using it for better things. And so most of the world's top thought leaders, venture capitalists, academics have all said there's tons of merit to this technology uh, and there's more there uh, than that. Um, and you've also maybe heard, oh, that Bitcoin went up to 1,000 and the price has gone down and it's probably going away. Uh, the reality is that it's growing exponentially. Every single metric, if you look at it closely aside from price, which is kind of the main primary barometer of sentiment, which is the data that most of you operate off of, uh, uh, every metric is up and to the right. So what is Bitcoin? Uh, it's digital value. It's fixed supply. It's programmable. It's a decentralized network, which means there's no governing body, there's no central authority, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, which means you can't shut it down. The only way to shut off Bitcoin is to shut off the internet indefinitely. And it's an incorruptible public ledger. You can't counterfeit money. So um, you'd say, well, why now? What is this? Is it something new? So for the last 30 years, people have talked about building uh, a system like this, but no one could figure out how. So if you were studying to become a PhD in cryptography, computer science, mathematics, it's very likely that you encountered this concept of the Byzantine generals problem, uh, better described as a double spend. So the protocols that make up the internet, TCP, IP, and such, um, don't allow for you to create unique uh, uh, assets or individual data. So for example, if I were gonna send you an email with a picture attached to it, or money, uh, when you receive that email, how do you know I didn't keep a copy for myself or send it to 10 other people simultaneously? This is the reason why piracy is a problem. And so Bitcoin's creator solved this incredibly complex uh, uh, problem by creating a, a shared database or a distributed ledger. Um, so this is something new. And uh, for the first time in human history, I can now transmit value from one person to another anywhere in the world with no middleman, with complete transparency. It's instant and the fees are negligible. And it's a very big deal. I mean, historically, you've always had to have a trusted intermediary or counterparty in the middle of every transaction, including those on the internet. So Bitcoin was the first application 
and I'm not really here to talk to you about that. I'm here to talk to you about blockchain technology. So think of uh, the blockchain is the technology that makes Bitcoin possible, and Bitcoin is the first application. So again, think of the blockchain as the operating system, and Bitcoin is now one of about 700 apps uh, that are trying to you know, create innovation around this space, and you're starting to see lots of major institutions uh, use it. But uh, I want to take us through kind of what I think of as the evolution of kind of technology as it relates to uh, what, what uh, is disrupting the world. In this case, we used to communicate with people verbally. Uh, and that was the verbal sort of communication era. Telecommunications enabled us to have synchronous communications with other people around the world. And obviously, a lot of interesting things happened as a result of that. The internet allowed us to have asynchronous and scalable uh, 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 communications with people around the world. And so I think of all of this as kind of the, the internet we use today as the internet of information. Uh, the blockchain is enabling the internet of value. So I can now transmit value in the same way that we can transmit data, again, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. Uh, and I think this is going to be you know, hugely disruptive, not just to things like uh, finance, kind of uh, ignored it initially, then decided, OK, I better understand it because there's a lot of interesting people uh, you know, voting with their feet and their time and their money. Uh, and so the first thing that you do in that situation is you analyze the threats and the opportunities. And like all things, you're going to recognize that there's going to be, this is going to be disruptive in a bad way in some ways. Uh, for banking, correspondent banking, for example, I think is a, a segment of the banking world that's going away completely. But there's also a lot of opportunity that comes with it. Uh, most of the financial institutions are focused on the middle and back office because we've seen a lot of um, innovation on the front sort of line of uh, uh, finance, algorithmic trading, high frequency, mobile banking, that the world's, you know, we've been seeing a lot of progress there, but the middle and back office was still designed for a world of paper, uh, you know, 50 to 100 years ago, and it's very antiquated. Um, and so they're focused mostly on that. You're not going to see a lot of top line revenue growth uh, uh, amongst these organizations, but what you're going to see is a lot of expenses get cut out of the business as they can more efficiently uh, run their businesses on these technologies. And some of the stuff's even older. Uh, take trade finance, uh, and, and we're in a, a city where that matters. $20 trillion a year is uh, you know, being transacted around the world, but we're running on 500-year-old technology, a thing called a bill of lading and a letter of credit, uh, where you have a, a cargo container and uh, a bearer share that says this is the person that's entitled to it. You're also seeing most of the world's top financial institutions uh, have all come into the space. Um, you know, uh, incumbents face the, the innovator's dilemma, which is, okay, I see a new technology, you know, uh, incumbents don't like uh, disruption generally because the status quo is working for them. Unfortunately, you can't stop innovation. So most of the world's financial ins uh, institutions were taking a look at this technology that was emerging. The actual moonshot is wonderful, inspirational, poetic, beautiful, involved, great technical challenges, genuine heroism. It brought the world together. But think about the Polynesian Islander on the dugout canoe deciding one day they were going to go that way. No one had ever been that way before. No one even knew if there was anything that way before. It was amazing and it changed the world. People can set their minds to magical, seemingly impossible ideas, and then through science and technology, bring them to reality. And that then sets other people on fire, that other things that look impossible might be accomplishable. Galileo is such a hero, you know, in thinking big, and what he represents to me is both curiosity and wonder that humanity had that he had that pushed him and drove himself to invent and work on the first telescopes that allowed us to see the moon and here we are these aviation pioneers were, were figuring it out as they went no one really knew how to build an airplane right no one knew how to fly an airplane it was amazing and crazy and wonderful and they wanted to explore many years ago the great british explorer george mallory who was to die on mount everest was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. There's so many challenges in the world and you can feel daunted by that, you know, and sort of oppressed by that. Or you kind of say, how might we think differently about this? Everyone else in the world is working on the next 10%. If you can be the one that delivers that 10 times improvement, you have a chance to really change things. If you want cars to run at 50 miles per gallon, fine, you can retool your car a little bit. But if I tell you it has to run on a gallon of gas for 500 miles, you have to start over. 
You need a lot of courage in this work and you need a lot of persistence. One of the things that's really critical is not only having the courage to keep trying every day or thinking big, even if you don't really 100% believe it's possible, like you might think this might be possible. Have the courage to try. That's how the greatest things have happened. You don't spend your time being bothered that you can't teleport from here to Japan because there's a part of you that thinks it's impossible. Moonshot thinking is choosing to be bothered by that. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Humanity's progress has been a series of amazing, audacious things from the very small and personal up to the great, big, and grand, and we are a species of moonshots. And to me, that's like the really amazing, poetic, and inspirational thing. I think our ambitions are a glass ceiling on what we can accomplish. When you find your passion, you're unstoppable. You can make amazing things happen. It's been true through all of history. I believe in the human spirit, and I believe that there are always going to be crazy people who will get out of bed one morning and say, you know what, I think I can build a space elevator, and we'll just go and do it. But I think that if we become afraid to take these great big risks, we stop inspiring people. We stop achieving things. And the biggest nightmare scenario is that we won't have what it takes to solve the really big challenges. Kennedy said that we would put a man on the moon. It's about the fact that he said, we don't know how to do this yet, and we're gonna do it anyway. And that sense chills up everybody's spine. Because if that happens, what couldn't we do?